so we're, we're getting it started here. Um, I'm just going to, uh, my name is uh, uh, Henry Wen, and I am the director of Upper School Global Scholars Program here at University School. I just want to say a few words of thanks to uh, uh, some of uh, the folks uh, who are here who have helped an awful lot. Uh, Laura Klein, Emily Erby uh, definitely did an awful lot to help uh, get the word out about this. I uh, want to welcome John Bakke from um, St. Marcus School, who's been uh, really a, kind of a, a great help in, uh, in pushing and helping us to promote the uh, goal of the uh, crisis simulation out in the greater Milwaukee area, and hopefully we'll continue to grow this. Um, this, this talk is our inaugural event in this year's crisis simulation, which uh, sadly looks like it's gonna be, there's going to be an awful lot of verisimilitude, which is a water crisis in East Africa. Um, I guess there's a bit of a drought there right now, and it's, uh, and it's deepening. So the, the, the students are going to be gaming a, a, a real-life situation coming up here, and, and uh, Mr. Rollins' talk is and his book will help kind of kicking this off. Um, I want to thank, uh, in particular, uh, the uh, um, members of the USM community who uh, helped to match some of the uh, uh, contributions from an EE4 grant that enabled us to have the money to be able to hold the, this event and to promote this uh, crisis simulation. So I want to just put that out there and thank all those in the community who uh, pitched in to help our Global Scholars program. So from, I'm going to ask uh, the jury to come up and to introduce our speaker, um, uh, Ben Rollins. He's going to uh, speak uh, for, I think, roughly 25 or so minutes and then be open for uh, comments and, and questions from the audience. So here she is. I don't think, I don't know if that thing's turned on or not. Okay. So you might as well just stop. Yeah. Okay. okay. So Ben Rollins holds a BA degree in Swahili and History from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London and a master's degree international relations from the University of Chicago. He's written for the New York Times, The Guardian, and the London Review of Books. His first book, Radio Congo, exposes the real story of Congo during and after the war there. He's also researched for the Human Rights Watch in the Warner of Africa. It was while working on the Human Rights Watch that Rollins visited the Dow, a town in Kenya that is the location of the world's largest refugee camp. As a result of his time at the Dow, Rollins wrote City of Thorns, a captivating book that tells the stories of nine individuals who live in the camp. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Ben Rollins. Thank you, Azira. That, that doesn't work, so I'll have to shout a little bit. Can you hear me in the back? If you need me to speak up or if you want to interrupt at any point, feel free. Um, my name is Ben, it's a pleasure to be here, um, and I'm going to talk to you about Dadaan. It's a refugee camp very far away from the Midwest, but as I hope you'll discover, there are a lot of commonalities between the people who live there and between us. So I'd like to tell you a few stories about some people who live in the camp, uh, because I find that stories are a better way of taking you there, of showing you what it's like, rather than showing you pictures. I could, I could sit here and show you a hundred pictures of the refugee camp, and you would recognize them. You would see the lines of tents, and you would think, I know what that is, that's a refugee camp. But actually, recognition and understanding are not the same thing. So, one of the reasons that I don't have pictures, I don't use PowerPoints, is that I think we need to sometimes stop looking and start listening and start imagining. And that's what the book is about, and that's what the stories I'm going to tell you are about. And after those stories, I'd like to talk a little bit about what they mean, and about setting them in context of this slightly crazy world that seems to be getting crazier every minute. Um, because I think the refugee crisis is a very good illustration of a lot of the problems that our countries are facing in terms of their inability to, to cooperate, to solve the problems of the world, and also of the divisions within our society as well. Um, the reasons why we still are stuck in this frame of us and them, of seeing ourselves as different from other people. But let me start with three stories. So three people who live in this camp but camp is really the wrong word. The title of the book is called City of Thorns, 
because when I first went there, I thought this is not a camp. This is a, a place that has been there for 25 years. It's the size of New Orleans, about 400,000 people, a little bit smaller than Milwaukee. It's a huge city spread over 50 square miles. And the people there can't leave, they can't work. There's no permanent plumbing, no sanitation, no permanent buildings, you can't pour concrete. The whole place is made of mud and sticks. And yet there are hotels, there are football leagues, there are elections, there are restaurants, there are cinemas, there's a whole life going on. And that is what I mean about recognition and understanding, that when you see a picture of a refugee camp, when you think of a refugee camp, you might not imagine all of that life going on. So the first story is about a young man called Gouled, who I met in the camp in 2010. And he had come there from Somalia. Most of the people in this camp, the biggest camp in the world, the biggest camp in the world, are from Somalia. Um, now you might remember a film called Black Hawk Down. Anybody remember Black Hawk Down? Or oh, there's a video game, I think, for those of you who are not my generation. Um, Black Hawk Down happened in 1993, when there was a war in Somalia, and the US tried to intervene. And pretty much since that time, the world forgot about Somalia. But the story of Goulet is the story of what happened next. Because he was born, he doesn't quite remember, but as far as we can figure out, he was born in October 1993, when those helicopters were shot down. And he was born in Wardingley district, which is the district where those helicopters crashed. And he grew up in Mogadishu, playing in the ruins of those helicopters. And he scratched a living, his parents died, he lived in a house with some other orphans. Uh, he got to the age of 16, by, by 2010 when I met him. And all through the war, he was still going to school. Because, as you know, in, in Syria, you may have seen recently, in, in many other war zones, people still go to school, they still go to work, they still try and carry on their life. And for some people, that is also a vote, a, a vote for hope, a vote for the future. So Gouled was going to school every day, until one morning in, in 2010, he was in geography class, and the teacher turned his back to the class and wrote the date on the board, and when he turned back to face the class, his face fell. And Goulet remembers looking at his face and thinking, oh my God, what's happened? And they turned around and they saw five armed men walking into the classroom with black turbans and with machine guns. And they made all the boys in the classroom stand up. And they picked the seven tallest boys in the, in the classroom, and Goulet was number seven. He's not a very tall guy, but he was at least the seventh tallest. What they did, they put blindfolds on these boys, they marched them out of the classroom, but maybe you can imagine them going down the steps there into a pickup truck, and then off, taken away. The next thing Goulet knew, when the blindfold was taken off, he was in a training camp for Al-Shabaab. And Al-Shabaab is a, a militant group linked to Al-Qaeda, and they control about 70% of Somalia. And at that time, they control more additional camps. So Gouled found himself in a, in a training camp, he's 16 years old, with lots of other boys he sees, and all these men around with beards and guns. <coughs> and he thinks, my God, I'm dead. That's it. My life is finished. But actually, he was lucky because he was assigned to what's called the Hizbat, which is the Al-Shabaab police. Now, the Al-Shabaab police, they are a bit similar to the Milwaukee police. They do the same kind of thing. They police traffic. They make sure that, that everybody's abiding by the law. <coughs> the law is Sharia law. So what the main thing that he had to do was to make sure that at the prayer time, Everybody was in the mosque praying as they should be. And they would patrol in the streets with their little black uniform. And there was two guys in the patrol, 15 boys in the patrol, and two boys with whips. 
And one day they were patrolling in the Mogadishu at the prayer time, and they found three young kids in a, a sort of shack, like a vegetable store, buying vegetables in the prayer time. They're desperately trying to shut the shop because they knew it was too late. But they got caught. And the head of the patrol shouted at the, at the three kids to lie down. And the two, go, two boys with the whips went forward and flogged the children who were lying on the ground. Goulet's watching, and he realizes that actually he, he recognizes one of those people on the, on the ground, the elder girl. And before he can look away, it's too late, he realizes, yes, it's his girlfriend. And in fact, it was his wife, because a few months before, if you have a sweetheart in Mogadishu, it's a conservative society, so you go to the bus station at break time, you pay five dollars, and you get married. And the sheikh says his words and pronounces you man and wife, so when you hook up later on, it's all halal or kosher. Um, so actually she was his wife, although technically it's probably more like a, a girlfriend. So he, it was his girlfriend there, he was watching her being beaten. And he looked away and she looked away because, of course, if they recognized each other, Al Shabaab could punish them both. Now, long story, I have to, I can't give you the whole book, but we're going to jump a bit. So, he later, a month later, escaped from Al Shabaab. He didn't go to see Maryam at her house because if he went there, maybe he would get him in trouble. Instead, he went to the refugee camp. Now, this shows you what it's like to even become a refugee, the challenge that people have to face. From Mogadishu to the border with Kenya south is 400 miles through Al Shabaab territory. He had to make that, that trip on his own. He got to the border, and at the border, there isn't a UN office and a cup of tea and a bus. There's just the desert. That's it. So he had to get from the border then to the refugee camp, which is 100 miles inside Kenya, across this desert. And if the Kenyan police had caught him, he would have been stripped of all his money and sent back to Somalia. Luckily, he made that trip. It's like a Hollywood movie, but I can't give you all the details. I have to summarize. But he made it to the camp. When he got to the camp, he's faced with another problem. Imagine this place that I described earlier, 50 square kilometers, 400,000 people. It's all made of sticks and plastic, and it's laid out because the refugee camp was made by the UN 20 years before, in 1991. It's laid out like Atlanta in these grids, these big squares. And in each square is maybe 60, 80 families, and these huge avenues go on for a mile in every direction. So it's completely confusing. Because when people were given, when a family came to the refugee camp in 91, they were given a square. And of course, everybody likes to have a fence around their yard. So they planted thorns. And those thorns now are three meters tall, four meters tall. So when you're looking around the refugee camp, you just see these huge tunnels of thorns. It's completely confusing. So he had to find the UN office within this refugee camp to present himself as a refugee just to get asylum. He made this incredible journey. So, again, fast forward. He does get to the UN office, he becomes a refugee, he gets his ration card, which is what it takes to be a refugee. That's your passport. That's your passport for food. But the food is only distributed every two weeks. So for two weeks he went hungry, then finally he gets his food distribution. It's like an airport, you get your car punched, you go through these enormous hangars, there's nine of them, and you get your rice, your beans, a little bit of oil, maybe a little bit of uh, lentils if you're a pregnant woman or you have your malnourished. And he, so he collected his food rations, they get weighed at the exit door, and then right outside the distribution center is the market. So what do you think he did? The first thing he, 
he did when he got his, whole, his hands on some food in the refugee camp after two weeks. The first thing he did when he exited the food distribution was to sell the food. Although he's hungry, what he wanted more than the food was two dollars from selling his food so he could buy a phone card so he could call in the market at the phone shop Marion in Mogadishu to say, I'm safe. So he, he rings Marianne in Mogadishu and she says, wow, that's great, what's it like? Because everybody's heard about the refugee camp, but they don't really have the, the detail. It, it's all full of rumors in Mogadishu, it's a long way away. And he doesn't really know, he's only been there for two weeks, so he says, wow, it's great, there's free food, and I'm on the list for a tent, but it never came, but I uh, didn't know that then. He said, there's school, there's free education, there's free healthcare, and I hear, that you can get resettlement to the United States. And she said, wow, that's brilliant. Send me $50 so I can get the bus and I can come. So he's, he's screwed. He doesn't, how can I get 50 bucks when I just have to sell my food for two dollars? You'll have to read the book to find out the answer to that question. But in the end, she makes it, she gets to the camp, and of course, she's completely destroyed. She said, what is this hell of? It's hot, the food's terrible, where's this tent you promised? And it's full of refugees. She doesn't consider herself a refugee. She said, in Mogadishu, at least we have a washing machine. So for her, this is a big shock. Plus, she has a secret. Can you guess what it is? She's pregnant. You read the book already. <laughs> no? Well done. She's pregnant. And she wants juice, she wants meat, she wants vegetables. All those things that you don't get in a refugee camp unless you've got more money. So the beginning of their honeymoon, the beginning of their married life starts under these incredible circumstances. The real pressure. The book follows them over the next three or four years and the drama of their life, which you catch up on if you want to. But that story, and we're going to move to the next one now, illustrates what it takes just to become a refugee. Some of the reasons why people flee, but also the challenges <coughs> just to even get into this camp, which is a nightmare in and of itself. But that is, is often what it takes to, to arrive there. Now, the second story, a little shorter, is about surviving in this place. So, some people, some refugees in the world, are you know, recently displaced, trying to get into these refugee camps. But there's another kind of refugee in the world, people who were born in camps, who have been there their whole life. And that's the experience of a young man called Nisho. Now Nisho, some of you who were here earlier, we talked about him, you've read the book. Nisho was uh, born in a camp, he's exactly the same age, as a cat. So that means this year he's 25 years old. And he grew up in the camp. He decided very early there was no point continuing with education because probably he would never leave and he couldn't get a job anyway in the camp. You're not allowed to work as a refugee. The only thing there is, is a black market. So he devoted himself to the black market to working as a porter, carrying sacks, big sacks, 50 kilos. So very heavy. If you imagine a little bit less weight than me carrying that on your back every day for a job, that's what he does. But he didn't earn much money like that. And by the time I met him, he was getting to be a young man. He wanted a wife. But in Somali culture, if you want a wife, you need camels. Or you need the cash equivalent of camels, which is very hard to come by where everything is a barter economy where you don't get hard cash very easily. So Nisha was kind of stuck. He couldn't find the money. But then, in 2011, a famine hit Somalia. Hundreds of thousands of people came across the border into the camp. The West was initially very slow to respond, but when they did respond, flooded the camp with lots of aid, <coughs> food day, all kinds of other stuff, all of which arrived in the market and Nisha unloaded on his back. 
So in the famine, he was making loads of dollars. He was happy. For him, the famine was a big opportunity. He stacked up lots of money. He went to a pretty girl he quite liked and said, I'm rich now, so how about it, sweetheart? <laughs> and she said, no, 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 you're still ugly. <laughs> you need more money. So she didn't want him. But what he found out was that the Turkish government, this is one of the reasons the Turkish government is so popular among the refugees, he found the Turkish government was going to give live food, so not dry food, which is what the US and the European Union give, but live food, and that means meat, that means goats and cows. So the Turkish government was going to give, a, give cows, and because they have a problem of dowry, raising dowry to get married in the camp, the elders said to the Turkish government, please, can we do a deal? You give us the camels, and we will distribute them in the camp, and we will make sure that, that they feed everybody, but they're going to do double duty. They're also going to act as a dowry for the young men who can't get married. So Nisho heard this plan was on the, on the table, and he made damn sure that he was on the list to get a camel. So now he had cash, he had a camel, but he didn't have a bride. So the clock's ticking, because the camels were being distributed at Eid, which is the end of Ramadan, and the, the famine was actually happening during Ramadan, so many people were fasting anyway, uh, hungry, and it was all rolled in together. But the clock's ticking, so that he's got three weeks to find a bride. He goes back to the pretty girl and says, I've got a camel now, and I've got all this cash. She says, no, you're still out <laughs> But he thought, well, there's all these people coming from Somalia. Maybe I can go and find a malnourished, cheap bride among the new arrivals. And, and I'm telling you the story as he told it to me. And he thought this was quite a clever idea. So he went to the outskirts of the camp where all the new arrivals were coming. And he went up to the first beautiful woman that he saw and said, I love you. Marry me. She said, you're nuts. She went back into her tent. But he came back the next day and he came with sugar, he came with fruit, he came with all the good stuff from the market. And after five days, her family said, okay, you can get married. Now she was thin, she was malnourished, but she was beautiful. The camel came on the day of Eid, just in time, slaughtered, everybody ate, the family was very happy, and now they're still living in the camp, they've got two children. So for Gulet, for, sorry, for Nisho, this was a fantastic opportunity. And it just goes to show, again, at that time, we were all seeing, if you watch the end at that time, images of this terrible refugee camp, this terrible famine. But behind the screen, all this other stuff is going on. The economy of the camp has a momentum of its own. Last story before I try to draw the wider conclusions. That's a little slice of life in the camp um, at the moment. The last point is leaving the camp. So somebody like Nisho uh, or somebody like Cairo, which is the young woman I was talking about, uh, don't have any opportunities to leave the camp. They can go back to Somalia, where the war is, but that's about it. They can't go down into Kenya. There's a roadblock. Kenya doesn't want refugees coming down into its land, uh, and the rest of the world doesn't want them either. They have, there's no, there's a resettlement process, which you may have heard about, there's many refugees are never settled, resettled to the Midwest, but it's only a very, very small number. The other legal avenue is an educational scholarship. Now, that's the only other sort of official way out of the camp. Now, Cairo was a young girl like Nisho, who grew up in the camp, went to primary school, and she was smart. So her parents, her mum, her dad died early, her mum, was desperate that Cairo was going to get one of these educational scholarships out of the camp, to Canada. Canada is the only country that offers them. And <coughs> she made sure that she collected firewood, because she had no other means of getting cash, and sold it in the camp so that she could buy what do you need to study in a refugee camp more than anything else? Batteries 
actually. Books are free from the UN, but if you want to read at night and do your homework, you need a torch with batteries. And that's quite expensive, that's a couple of days' food. So her mum went hungry and worked in order to buy her daughter batteries so she could study. And of course, all this pressure is on Cairo to do well, to become one of the top 10 high school graduating seniors who were picked for the scholarships to Canada. So you have 3,000 students in the secondary schools in the camp, all dreaming of Canada, because Canada is the only place where they can go and get a full ride to do a bachelor's degree. So Cairo studied and studied and studied, along with her classmates. Imagine you guys all contributing $2 a week for the whole school year until you get to the exam time so that you can rent a house with electric lights for a month during the exam period so that you can do your extra studies to cram the exams. That's what they did. They all contributed a little bit of money and rented a house uh, to do their exams. The exams came, but the exams arrived just at the same time as the Kenyan army invaded Somalia there, was a, there, were the, uh, there were some people kidnapped in the camp. Kenya used this as a justification to invade Somalia. So the war came to the camp. Al Shabaab retaliated. There were landmines. There were people getting killed. So Cairo did her exams, and the invigilators were soldiers. So imagine doing your exam in this hallway, and the guys taking you to the bathroom are soldiers in all their gear with machine guns standing outside of the stall while you have your two minutes. That was the condition under which she did her exams. So finally, I was with her four months later when the results came, and everybody's on tenter books. You know, were they going to be in that, that top ten and get to Canada? And she just missed it. So she was, she was sad, but what it meant was it enabled her to get a job as a teacher in the camp. There were some, some People can't, the refugees can't work, but there are some jobs that they are allowed to do um, for a small, small amount of money. So she then became a teacher in the camp, and that's what she's still doing now. And it meant that she had a little bit of money so she could buy pink sandals, a pink hijab, a pink mobile phone, and pink nail polish. <laughs> so some of her needs were met as a result of her education. Not the, her biggest need, but some of them. Now, I think those three stories, what they show you is a little bit of life in this camp. And what this camp shows you is an example of, it, uh, it's a window onto this wider crisis, which is the refugee crisis that we're all familiar with at the moment. Particularly in Europe, but also in the United States. There are many Somalis, hundreds of Somalis on the border coming over from Mexico, trying to get into the United States. Uh, along with many other nationalities, plenty of Africans, I think 8,000 this year so far. So, this is a global problem. And what Dadao shows you is a little bit of the reasons why it's a crisis, because of where we've come from. It gives you a window onto how the crisis is currently being managed, or not managed, or mismanaged. And I think it gives a little uh, insight into where we're going as well. Now, where we've come from is a situation where the UN, after World War II, helped, uh, was set up by nations to manage and help them deal with the refugee crisis after World War II, to move people across borders and to, and to manage this displacement. And that process worked relatively well up until the 1990s. In uh, the Bosnian conflict, a million Bosnians came to Europe and were integrated into Europe. It wasn't even front page news. It was just what happens. Ten years later, after the dates and the cause, half of those people, half a million, went back to Bosnia. What we've seen after 9-11 and the last 15 years is new kinds of wars which don't seem to end. So before, you had a war like Bosnia or Rwanda, which was a brief period of conflict and then peace, stabilization, rebuilding, and so on. What we have now, Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Sudan, Yemen, etc., etc., 
are these ongoing militarized situations which don't seem to have any kind of end. And that means that refugees, what was supposed to be a temporary solution, a refugee camp, is actually becoming a permanent thing. So Dadao's been there for 25 years. There are camps between Burma and Thailand that have been there for 40 years. There are camps in Chad from the Darfur refugees that have been there for 17 years. There is the camps in Gaza, which have been there for 60 years. Now, Gaza was supposed to be an exception, but instead it's becoming the rule because we live in this world that can't seem to manage anymore displaced people and refugees. So this, the, the, the present now, is this place where we have camps that are in fact cities. And we're building more of them. Europe has just given three billion dollars, three billion euros to Turkey to build more camps because nations don't want to integrate those people into their own populations. They want to keep them separate. And that, I think, speaks to where we're going because I think we're just at the beginning. The, the numbers of people moving at the moment are large, historically. They're unprecedented since World War II. But I think they're only the tip of the iceberg to the displacements that we're going to see in my lifetime. And I'm talking principally about climate change. But there will be lots of war that follows on the heels of climate change. Already, the wars in, in South Sudan, and certainly the wars in the Horn of Africa, have a lot to do with climate. Because the, the, the landscape, the drought, the war, have all always gone hand in hand. But, Large parts of the Sahel are going to become uninhabitable. Those people are going to go north to Europe and they're going to come south, which ultimately means the United States because they're going to go to Central America and up. You're already seeing climate refugees in the United States. Miami, Louisiana, it's on the news at the moment. We're seeing them in Britain, in the Somerset levels, uh, in parts of, uh, of, of the Lake District, which are getting flooded now regularly. So, what that does, I think, and this comes to the, gets to the, the heart of, of the political challenge now, is it poses a question. The refugee crisis poses a question to the nation. It says, who are you? Who are you and what are you made of? And nations are having to decide. And I think, unfortunately, many nations are coming up with the wrong answer. Uh, because there is, you can look at a refugee and you can see somebody that you can take a decision. You can say that's them, and this is this is me, or that's a fellow human being. You can say that's a burden, or that's an opportunity. Now there are some nations like Germany, like Canada, like Uganda, for whom a refugee is an opportunity, and in a way has become a kind of bargaining chip. So Jordan, for example, now has used its refugee programs to bargain for a special economic zone with the World Bank, providing cheap credit to establish factories where refugees and Jordanians will work together. On the other side, you have countries like Kenya, which are using refugees as bargaining chips in a negative way, as saying Europe's not looking after its refugees, it's not meeting its moral obligations, so we're not going to meet ours. And Kenya wants to push all those refugees back into Somalia. It's trying to close down the refugee camp at the moment. And this, to me, I, I find very hard to understand. Why is it that we can't see these refugees as productive residents, as people with talents, with a lot to contribute, when all of the economic studies show that immigration is a net benefit to GDP is a net benefit to creativity, to the dynamism of the community. This is something that Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, argued at the World Economic Forum. He said, I'm not arguing for refugees to come to Canada because it's the right thing to do. I'm, I want it because it's good for our economy. Because he looked at the data, he saw that all of the tech pioneers in Canada who were being snatched up by Silicon Valley were first and second generation immigrants, many of them refugees. So for him, that, that was a strategic choice. And for some reason, he's able to look at the issue rationally and morally. And Angela Merkel is able to look, uh, 
Chancellor of Germany, because they always look at the issue rationally and economically. And that was a big part of the argument where she made a, a big, um, a, a very big political decision. She said, Dear Mackandas, we can do it. And she accepted a million refugees into Germany because Germany is being depopulated, the East needs more uh, labor, uh, the economy needs to grow. And I think Germany will see the fruits of that. So we're in very strange times where some nations are falling on one side of the argument and other nations are falling on the other side. My country, Britain, has been shamed. But it's very interesting because although the governments are falling one way and the other and are really struggling with this, everywhere I've been for the last nine months talking about this book and speaking to people about refugees, you find communities who are coming together in extraordinary ways to welcome refugees. Churches, community groups, mosques, synagogues, individuals traveling great distances to Lesbos and Greece to Calais, where the Jews now between France and Britain, donating loads of stuff, money, quitting their jobs. This really, I think, extraordinary social movement, uh, which I think will also define this era in a similar way. So you've got two very contradictory movements. You've got this kind of reactionary political attitude, <coughs> the, 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 the David Camerons and the Theresa May and the Donald Trumps and so on, who don't want anything to do with them. And then you have also, uh, I think, a very edifying social movement. Um, and I, you know, I, I sort of, I don't really understand it. And I, what I'd like to do is to see some a bit more coming together because although it's great that all of these communities are doing these things, the resources and the heft and the diplomatic weight lies with the states. So if we can get the government to be to, to be a bit more representative, I think, to represent some of that uh, outpouring of, of sympathy and energy that we are seeing in many communities around the world, then I think we're moving to uh, a situation where we're better able to cope with this displacement. Because back to this question, I think as more and more people are moving around the world, it's going to place incredible stress on economies, and on political, uh, political arrangements. And this idea of the nation state, I think the, the, it, it, the question gets to the heart of those two words. Because are we a nation, or are we a state? Or are we a little bit of both? And I think the, the, the nation states that are more state than nation, like for example, Canada, where they have a more secular, legalistic, notion of citizenship are going to be better able to cope with this coming turmoil that I think climate change represents. And this is why Brexit and the, 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 sort of the potential unravelling of the European Union is also very sad, because the European Union was the ideal vehicle for dealing collectively with the refugee problem. But when that question was posed to the European Union, are you a EU? which can act together to deal with this problem? The answer was no. Actually, we're all little parochial states afraid of each other, and we're going to put our walls up again. So my final point, really, is both a quite a bleak assessment of global politics, but also quite a hopeful experience of the ways in which communities are coming together and are posing <coughs> questions of social justice. Our governments are not keeping pace with the, after neoliberalism, this rise in, in a hunger, I think, for social justice. So that, I think, is exciting, um, which is why it's a pleasure to come and talk about this with you, and I'm going to stand here and ask you some questions. Thank you.
Okay, another question, one more. What is the Okay. Um, the nationality of people born in the camp, you are technically stateless. You get a Kenyan ID card, a Kenyan uh, birth certificate, which is stamped with a big red stamp that says refugee. So you can't apply for Kenyan citizenship. You can't apply for Somali citizenship unless you go back to Somalia. Or if you're Ethiopian or Sudanese or whatever, you go back to your country. So you're stuck. Um, how long have I been interested in this topic? Since 2010, and I went to this camp, and I, I was head of human rights watch in the Horn of Africa, so I was responsible for a team of people researching human rights issues in that area. And I'd heard of this place, but I never knew really what it was like or what it meant. And as soon as I went there, I thought, my God, this is like another planet. It's like Star Wars. It resembles this world, but it's something totally alien. And then I thought, I have to write about it, I have to tell other people about it. What inspired me, well, that's kind of the same question. So I went there and I thought, this is nuts. I have to, I have to speak about this and somewhere else. Yes? Since your research and writing this book, have you seen any actions come out of that? Have actions come out of my own research? <coughs> okay. Yep. Um. What or who made you have to go to this refugee camp? Okay. Another one? Yeah. How did you get out of the refugee camp? How did I get out? Well, that's a good question. Um, and I'll link it to your, your neighbor's question. Um, why did I go there in the first place? Because I was sent there for work. I was sent there to interview people who had run away from Somalia to find out what they had run away from. How was the war going on in Somalia? What kind of abuses were happening there to those people? But as well as in doing my job, I was also interested in this place where they had ended up, which was the camp. Um, and how did I leave? I, live, I left because I have a British passport, so I can go past those roadblocks, those Kenyan roadblocks, um, and go back to Nairobi, the capital, and I can fly home again. But the refugees don't have a passport. They don't have any state. Um, but it's interesting because when a foreign visitor goes to the camp, you have to be a guest of the UN because the United Nations runs the camp. Um, and part of that is because there have been there has been a history of kidnapping. So a Western person is valuable, worth about two or three million dollars in ransom. So the UN wants to make sure that no Westerners are kidnapped, otherwise they have to suspend all their services, they have to evacuate their staff, it's a big headache. So for me and for other visitors, you have to stay in this UN compound, which is like a green zone. It's about two square miles, and there's razor wire, and there's these big six foot blast walls. And inside there is a bar, and a restaurant, and a tennis court, and air conditioning, and an air conditioned gym, uh, and all kinds of good stuff. So all of the, the international workers who are running the camp and all of the journalists and visitors like me stay in that place and then the camp is all out there, all the way around. And you can see it and they can see you but they can't come in. So there's a, there's a real divide there. There's a, you know, one side of the tracks and the other side of the track. Some of us can come and go but they have to stay there. Sorry, and then the other question, I forgot that. Have you seen any, any change? Effects? Yeah. Um, yes, um, there's been. Um, it, the books had a lot of um, press in Kenya, and I was there last week. There was a. Um, there's been lots of media coverage. The UN is kind of. They're not really doing anything, but they're jumping up and down because there's a lot of media coverage, and they feel like they should be doing more. But the main thing at the moment is that the Kenyan government has said it wants the camp shut. So. A lot of the panic is about what to do now. Um, with all these people who are there, the war's still going on in Somalia, they can't go back to Somalia, where are they going to go? Um, so it, I haven't seen any direct impact um, from the book, but I can say that a lot more people know about this place. And there have been some individual interests from <coughs> incidentally Canadian churches actually in helping me set up some Yes? Have you um, followed up with some of the children that went to school in Canada and you plan to follow up with them? Okay. Yeah. 
Oh, uh, what's the next chapter for you? Is it just like speaking out about what you're going to do next, or um, kind of what's the chapter in Okay, thank you. One more? Yeah. How did you come to work for Human Rights Watch? Uh, let me start with that one, and then I'll work backwards. Um, I, like many young British people, I went on a gap year between high school and university, and I went to teach English in Tanzania. And I loved it, so I went, when I came home, I changed my degree at university, and I studied Swahili. So I learned Swahili, and I was very interested in Tanzania, and I ended up, uh, I worked for a time in politics in Britain, and I worked for the UN for a little while in New York, and then after that, I, my friends in Tanzania said, why don't you come and help us run our election campaign? I was friends with the opposition party. So I ran the election campaign in, in Tanzania in 2005. Many of my friends were beaten up and thrown in jail. And I was communicating with Human Rights Watch, telling them about what was going on. And then they said, well, why don't you come and work for us now, if you're not doing anything else? So I then became their elections guy. I did elections in Uganda, Nigeria, Kenya, Ethiopia, and then climbed the Greece and Poland after that. And then resigned to write a book about, about um, City of Thorns. And the next step is, yes, speaking out. Um, I've been part of being in Nairobi last week, was lobbying the UN, lobbying the, the Kenyan government. Um, so there's various projects that have come out, uh, come out of that. But principally, I'm a writer, so I've got another book right now, or two or three, um, which are, I'm currently working on. Um, and in terms of following up the, the people in Canada, that's not, I mean, no, I'm not going to follow up with those people. There are many people in Canada, hundreds of people in Canada, who have come through the camp, and many of whom have actually gone back to Mogadishu and who are at the forefront of building peace in Somalia. So one of the things I think that Western civil society can do, perhaps the, the biggest, most effective investment in, in peace, is to educate refugees from the camps who will go back. So I have, when I've been speaking at universities, been saying, can you commit to take one? One refugee, give them a full ride, and you will be amazed at the impact that one person has when they leave them. There is a very good book called Citizens of Nowhere by a Canadian journalist called Debbie Goldman, and it's referenced in the notes to my book. She followed a whole bunch of students from the dam to Canada, and it's a great book. Yeah? So, are you one of the few who is really, because you've done the kind of, I mean, not really, like, who's really done the kind of research on this refugee camp, or have there been other, like, other journalists who have kind of, I wonder if you could talk about, I'm thinking about Cairo, about refugees who become so assimilated into the city of Thorns, into the city of Thorns, yeah. that, that becomes their home. Yeah. And so we know, I wonder if you talk about that <coughs> psychologically, you have those, if you have those psychological conversations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One more? Um, I guess, I don't know if you have an answer to this, but like, what could we do to like, help refugees in Milwaukee? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. Um, yes, uh, lots of people have been to the dam. Um, journalists go there all the time. It's very photographed and covered. There are some documentaries. Um, there's a very good website by an American filmmaker, which is called dadabstories.org, with lots of little film, films of mm -hmm. the dam. So you know if you've seen it before. Um, so there is, there's quite a lot there. There's no real. Um, kind of book-length narrative treatment of the dad, apart from the, the woman that Debbie Godwin has followed his students to Canada. Um, so I, that's why I thought I, I could write a book because no one else did. Um, there's an academic book by um, somebody called, I forgot the name, it's in the bibliography. Um, it's called Transitional Nomads, and that's about the refugee life. Um, so there's lots of academic study, but there's no real sort of popular stories. I'd love to see a movie. <coughs> That's what I'd like to see. A movie. So 
more and more people can know about. Um, this idea of being institutionalized is absolutely at the heart of, of the camp and at the heart of being a refugee. <coughs> what you think is possible after all of your horizons have been so limited and, and you've been so sheltered. Um, so Nisho, for example, only recently has begun to start thinking about going back the possibility of going back to Somalia. All the time I knew him doing the writing of the book, he was adamant. This is my home, I'm not going anywhere, because it's what he knew. Um, so, yes, it's, it's identity is at the heart of, of the problems that we face. So, another example is Tawane in the book, who has this, uh, there's a word they coined in the doubt called Bufis, which is this kind of depression, where your feet are in the refugee camp, but your head is in the United States. And you're torn, your body's torn in between. So he's longing to be in the United States with his friends because he's on Facebook, but his reality is in the refugee camp. And some days he's just catatonic, he can't get out of bed, he's completely depressed. So people have different ways of coping with this situation. One of them is, is, uh, is every day to manufacture some kind of hope, some kind of different hope. So people's idea of themselves changes every day. One day you ask the way, are you going to go back to Somalia? Yes, it's going to be great, I'm going to start a business. The next day you ask him, no, never, I'm staying here, I'm going to buy a Kenyan passport, I'm going to become Kenyan. You know, the next day you ask him, he's like, I don't know, go away, I'm depressed. So people have a very unstable sense of themselves, it's not fixed. Um, sorry, one, two, what was the other question? I'm not very good at remembering. What can you do in Milwaukee? Um, I think you could start a conversation about whether or not the school could sponsor refugees to come and study here. That's a possibility, I would imagine. It, it's a bureaucratic headache for your teachers to get the, the federal approval and so on. But there are schools that have that do allocate places for refugees and give them scholarships. So that's one thing. There are um, every town, I think, in the, in the U.S. and certainly in the U.K. has refugee support groups who resettle refugees, who befriend refugees who've been resettled here. And I met two ladies this afternoon who do that in Milwaukee. But they're based in another school um, nearby. So you can befriend people who were sent here who were resettled. Um, and also, I think, you know, you guys growing up, you can educate yourselves about the world about it, which is what you're doing in this Global Scholars Program, which is great. And you can then begin to understand this, this landscape of all of these different actors who play these different roles. So there's definitely lobbying of the federal government to be done. There's writing letters to your congressperson, to your senator. Um, there's pressuring them in whatever public forums you, you, you have the chance you know, to be in. Um, and then there's, you know, there's always money, there's always raising money, there's plenty of organizations, that, you know, but that's, that's another conversation. But I would start with your own institution, I think, because the resources that all of these educational facilities have would be fantastic for one or two refugees. Can we all go home? Okay. Um, obviously, the Turkish people and the government have been really, really good to displace people. Um, this big population of displaced people in uh, Turkey. Yeah. And they also provided a lot of food uh, to the refugee camp. Is there something culturally, uh, socio social, sociologically, that, that caused that, or is it simply like just an economic um, factor? Yeah, okay. Turkey? Yes. What do you think of the um, recent inclusion of a refugee team in the Olympics? In the parallel. Yeah. I'm going to start taking two at a time because obviously my memory is not <laughs> important. Um, Turkey, uh, to some extent, it's naked geopolitics. <coughs> the, the, the Turkey is in, is in this kind of nationalist phase where it's trying to regain the Ottoman Empire. And Somalia is a nation down on its knees. They're fellow Muslims, so the Somali people really appreciate the culturally appropriate aid that they're providing. Um, but, so there's good aspects to it, but there is also a sinister underside that Turkey is investing heavily in lots of infrastructure in Somalia. They're, they're 
they hit the contracts, um, they're, they're trying to you know, get a, a foothold of influence against um, in the US and other people in the region. So it's a bit of both. Uh, and uh, oh, I can't even remember one question. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, the Olympics. The Olympics. Um, I think, in a way, it's a shame that, that we have to have that we're now, we haven't solved the refugee crisis and therefore we're making them into their own nation. That's not right. I mean, it's great that they're able to participate and they wouldn't otherwise be able to participate, but unfortunately for me, it kind of institutionalizes this permanent displacement. Um, really, those people should all be running for new nations or, or jumping for new nations. That's, that's really what they should be doing. But because we're stuck and nobody wants to help, um, nobody wants these people, we have to do that instead. So two questions down here. Yes. Good question, yeah. Okay, so if you didn't hear the question, the first one was, did I like it there and why did I leave? And the second question was, was I able to experience firsthand the life of a refugee? Uh, no, I wasn't, because I, the UN keeps me separate, because, because of their own needs and their own agenda, they don't allow me to live in the refugee camp. When I first went, my plan was to go and spend six months living in the refugee camp, but the week I arrived, two nurses for Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, were kidnapped. So the UN shut down everything and didn't allow any Western visitors go into the camp anymore. If you want to go into the camp, you have to have bodyguards. So every day I went from this compound with four armed policemen, so with machine guns who go in my car. I was in a pickup truck there in the back. I'm driving around the, the camp. And then when I interview people, they're waiting outside. And they only allow you an hour because they're, they're worried that I'm going to get snatched. So I have an hour to interview my people, go back to the UN compound, go out again for an hour in the afternoon. So no, unfortunately I wasn't able to be as free as I would have liked. Now, I like to think that the, the threat was actually minimal, and if I'd have been allowed to be free it would have been fine, but I don't know that. Nobody can know that, for sure. Um, did I like it there? Yeah, I loved it. I, what I love about the place is the life. And the, and the energy and the, and the welcome. It's, it's probably the most democratic place I've ever been. Everybody's equal. Nobody has, you know, there's a little bit of, some people have more than others, but by and large, that 1% is, is, is actually not that far from the 99% to use the, the current terminology. But that gap is very small. So everybody's, um, Everybody's business is everybody's in everybody's business, but it's but it's great. There's a real cooperative feeling. It's very warm um, and it's beautiful. The desert is beautiful. It's in this place. It's miles from anywhere. At night, there's no lights. Cairo has got a torch, but there's these lights. There's the, the 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 stars are amazing. So yes, I really did like it. I really like the closeness to 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 people and their lives and their and their struggles. And why did I leave? Because I've got my own family and uh, my own children and I've got to look after them as well. There's a Swahili saying which is Untu Kwao, which the, the refugees like a lot. And it means a person belongs at home. Yeah? Would you, like, would you ever like for your kids to visit there? Would I like my kids to visit there? Okay, another question. Yeah. Can you talk about your future projects that you're working on right now? As far as okay. I would love for my kids to be able to see as much of the world as possible. Um, at the moment, they're, they're a bit small, two and a half and six months. So <laughs> taking them to the camp would be a bit much. But I don't see any reason why I couldn't take them there. If I'm safe, then they could be safe. Um, and I think it would be great for them to see see that, that side of life. One of the things we were talking about earlier today, which I think is a shame, is the extent to which people in different situations, often in the same country, don't really mix, don't really see what life is like, even in their own town.
So I think it's very important. I think it's part of education, actually, to understand different social realities from your own, to go and see how other people live. So I would hope that for my kids as well. Um, but other projects, uh, one of the, the next, the main next one is about colonialism. Is about my own family's involvement in colonialism over three generations and how that has impacted where British society is now. Okay, I think that's a wrap. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Rollins.